Hi everyone, my name is Martin Glavin. I'm a lecturer in Electrical and Electronic Engineering. I'm also the Program Director for the, the Electronic and Computer Engineering programs, both the BE and ME. So thanks for taking the time out to listen to my talk. I'm going to tell you a bit about autonomous vehicles. I've been researching uh, on cars and sensors and uh, processing and electronics for about 20 odd years at this stage. Um, have kind of grown up through the uh, the development of the autonomous vehicle uh, from the time when we were just putting cameras on cars because it was a cool thing to do, uh, right up to uh, the development of the, the early um, stages of autonomous vehicle technology. And now as we start to see cars moving closer to becoming a reality, um, we're looking at uh, how to make them safer, how to work, make them work better in more hostile environments, uh, more difficult environments where there's um, poor weather conditions, poor lighting, um, very busy scenes where there's lots of people, lots of vehicles, uh, and the question is how to do that safely and uh, also how to do it at a reasonable cost so that um, ordinary people can afford these cars. So um, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll enjoy just maybe learning a little bit more about why autonomous cars um, are difficult to get on the road in the first place. Uh, why we need them, why we absolutely need them, uh, and uh, what are the unforeseen challenges and unforeseen um, quirks that are going to uh, crop up in the environment as, uh, as autonomous cars start to roll out. When we think about autonomous vehicles, I think this is kind of like the, the vision most people have, uh, not so much the dogs in the car uh, being driven to the park for their little walkies or anything like that, but the fact that the car can drive itself and that no human needs to be involved. Um, but as we'll see, the just even using the term autonomous vehicles um, is, is in, its, in its own way uh, incorrect. There is no such thing really as an autonomous vehicle at the moment. Um, and when we talk about levels of autonomy, that's how, really how we should be referring to uh, autonomous vehicles. We should be saying, what level of capability um, uh, does, this, uh, does this vehicle have? Uh, but maybe let's just take a, a little step back from, from autonomous vehicles for a moment and look at the reasons why they're necessary. Sorry to kind of uh, bring you back to, to today and uh, all the troubles in the world with COVID, but uh, I thought this graph was interesting because as you can see, from the start of the year um, until about today when the, the video is being recorded, we haven't quite hit the million um, deaths yet um, uh, from COVID-19. And um, while it's really, really shocking and terrible that uh, so many people die uh, from this illness and, you know, we're bombarded with this all of the time and we're talk told about face masks and we're told about social distancing and all the things we can't do. What people don't really realize is that the road can be a really scary place too. And that every year, 1.2 million people die on the road. So just, uh, I, I suppose I'm kind of struck by the parallels between uh, COVID uh, and the fact that, you know, every year there's 1.2 million people dying on our roads. And really there's, uh, there isn't a kind of a, a global outcry or a, or a, a panic, uh, or there's nobody wearing masks to try to, uh, to, to help to solve this problem. Um, and, and it just keeps going every single year. Uh, and what's nearly worse than the 1.2 million people that die is that there's 20 to 50 million people who receive non-fatal injuries. Now, these, these non-fatal injuries are still life-changing. Uh, some people uh, may lose limbs, may lose mobility, um, may, may suffer um, pain and anxiety and, uh, and psychological issues uh, as a result of, uh, of, of road accidents. So really, we're not safe on the road. Um, letting people out to drive a car is not a safe thing to do. We need technology to support us and indeed take over from us because arguably technology is, is much safer. Now, the problem is we have a bit of a journey to go on uh, to, to get to a point where technology can actually help to save lives on the road. And that's the journey we're on at the moment. So why do accidents happen? Well, we all know this, the, the old stories, the things that are always blamed, too much speed, poor driving habits, road conditions, and the road is never good enough, and the uh, use and abuse of alcohol and drugs, and the lack of enforcement, and our laws that we don't necessarily agree with, 
um, environmental conditions, so rain, fog, snow, ice, all of those things that can cause uh, cause problems. Vehicular factors, so maybe some failure in the vehicle or poorly maintained vehicles or uh, maybe the tires are, are, are not as, uh, as fresh as they should be on the vehicle. Um, but distraction is the new one that has come along in the last few years. Um, we now have so many different uh, ways that we can be distracted. Primarily, I suppose 99% of the time the distraction comes from our mobile phone or, or some other mobile device that, uh, that will uh, call our attention away. Uh, and when you are um, texting or looking at uh, your phone or, or using whatever social media platform is of interest to you, you are not safe. So you really should never ever uh, drive and text or use your phone or interact with it in any any way. Um, while you're driving, it means that you take your eyes off the road for about 1.4 seconds every time you look. So it effectively means that even though um, maybe you as a, as a, a young fish individual, um, you know, with the, the reflexes uh, that are that, that go with that, uh, that stage of life, it means that when you're on your phone and when you are texting, when you are um, uh, answering a social media um, uh, call or whatever it might be to respond to some something on social media, your reflexes um, slow down to that of, uh, of an 80 year old. Um, so your reaction times slow down very significantly and the stopping distances for your, uh, for your car uh, go up uh, by several tens of meters uh, just by the fact of being distracted looking at a second screen. So the big, biggest risk on the road nowadays is the driver. There's a little bit of Homer in all of us when we get into the car. You know, our car will never have an accident if it's left sitting in the car park. It's only when you sit into it and you take control of that and you assume responsibility for the control of the car, um, that's when the, 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 the problems occur. So how do we solve the problem? Well, we can do all the old stuff, uh, enforce the laws and improve the infrastructure and educate and help drivers and we can get out there with radar speed traps and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's never going to work. It hasn't worked for generations and it's not going to work now. Um, but we could make our cars more intelligent. Um, so uh, what we're trying to do is, uh, is trying to make them uh, a little bit smarter by being able to sense their environment and then make some uh, sense of the environment by by figuring out what's around them and if you know what's around you if you know where you're going and if you can project forward to where other people might be going on their journeys then you can um, predict um, what the likely outcome might be and uh, and take action to um, to solve that um, but it's not an easy task because uh, not everywhere is uh, nice clean roads with small numbers of traffic, small numbers of pedestrian and uh, everybody obeying the rules. There are places around the world like this junction here um, where you have um, kind of law of the jungle really on the road. It's, uh, it's usually the biggest vehicle in many countries, the biggest vehicle gets right away. Um, so you basically try to force your way through. Um, regardless of, of what the lines are written on the road or what the, the traffic lights might say. But for the most part, um, we try to um, visualize autonomous cars working in some kind of reasonably civilized manner, uh, obeying um, the road markings, obeying the, uh, the traffic lights, obeying the laws of the, of the land. Um, so it's going to be a challenge to get these, uh, these cars to, uh, to behave themselves and to, uh, and to manage to cope uh, across all the different environments that they're going to encounter. But at the very outset, I was saying um, that when we talk about an autonomous car, it's not really accurate, it's not really a correct thing to talk about an autonomous car. We really should talk about cars and the level of automation that they have. So we could say that level zero is no automation, where you have a stupid car, which basically just as a steering wheel, um, you control the, the speed with the pedals, you brake with the pedals, and then you, you steer with the steering wheel. You're responsible for everything. You never hand over any control to, to any system in the car. Level one then is where you can take your feet off. It's kind of like the old fashioned uh, cruise control where you can uh, set the speed with the buttons on the steering wheel usually, and then take your feet off the pedals. Uh, you're still to steer the car, um, but you, um, uh, you'd, at least you don't have to uh, control the speed or worry about the pedals. Level two is where you can take your hands off. Uh, this is normally where it's just momentarily take your hands off the wheel and the, uh, the vehicle will you know, stay in lane or, or, or uh, perform some simple, um, very, very simple maneuvers where you can take your hands off. Level three then is where you can take your eyes off. 
um, where you can your eyes can leave the road again for a very short period of time. Um, maybe it's something like a, an automated parking system, but you're, you, you don't necessarily have to be looking everywhere all of the time, but you are still absolutely responsible for uh, the safety of the, the vehicle. So can be useful in low, low speed stuff or maybe out on motorways where, uh, where there really isn't much going on other than just keeping in lane and making sure you don't uh, run into the car in front of you or something like that. Level four is where it really gets interesting. It's where you can switch your brain off, where basically the car will take care of, uh, of, of any issue that it comes across. You're still um, there to take over from the car when it reaches a point where it just, you know, comes to a junction and just cannot really figure out what's going on or maybe there's roadworks in the road and the lane markings are, are confusing with the uh, maybe there's uh, there's signs out telling you particular things the car just can't figure it out and uh, that can happen and and it's expected that with level four automation that will happen reasonably regularly but um, the idea is that um, as time rolls on more and more cars will be able to stay at level four for longer Level five then is where you don't need the driver, where you can send the car off to collect the children from school or you can uh, you can go for a sleep um, while the car takes care of the, the driving for you. So really it's just a, a metal box um, with uh, with some computers in it and you say, I want to go to the shop, I want to go to see my aunt, I want to uh, drive to the cinema, whatever it might be, and the car just knows where you, where you want to go and you never have to take uh, any um, responsibility for the vehicle. In some ways, people say it would be easier to implement level five than level four, level four or level three, because part of the problem is that um, you never really know who's in control, whether it's the driver or whether it's the the computer and the brain that's uh, that's running the, the vehicle itself. So there are cars that are out there. I suppose the Tesla is kind of really really famous uh, as the uh, um, the for its, its levels of autonomy and for um, just how intelligent the vehicle is. But even in America, there's uh, they say it's one of the most advanced cars is the, the Cadillac uh, with its super cruise function and it has loads of roads. So you can see that there's about 130,000 miles of highways that have been mapped in great detail um, so that you can go into super cruise uh, and, uh, and give you a pretty high level of autonomy. Um, seems to work at somewhere around level four um, I think what companies are starting to do now is they're starting to talk about kind of level 3.5 and level 3 plus plus and all that kind of stuff so they're they're trying to uh, be a little bit more kind of um, choosy about how they, they describe the levels of automation but this seems to be around level 4 for the roads that it's permitted on and uh, the car just won't uh, allow you to go into that level of autonomy if you go off any of the roads that are mapped here but you can see a good bit of the US is uh, is covered and it's likely we'll see things like that happening here. So I suppose the thing at the moment is that uh, cars, uh, even the, 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 the Teslas that claim to be completely um, able to take, you know, to, to drive uh, unsupervised should be supervised like this. You should uh, absolutely by all means, if you want to take your hands off the steering wheel, go ahead and do it, but make sure that your hands are there ready to grasp uh, control of the vehicle. Um, because, you know, there is still a, a, a small, but, a, but still um, statistically significant chance that the car is going to screw up at some time uh, along your journey. And you really need to be watching for that and mindful of that. The danger is that, you know, you've spent all this money on your, your lovely new Tesla and you spend all this money on your suit and your shoes and your hairdo and you're too cool uh, to um, to supervise your car that you, you know, you, you, you want this thing to work for you. So uh, it's all about the image. The problem is, um, this is the thing that can that can happen. So on the 7th of May 2016, this guy Joshua Brown um, had a crash in this car. It's going along at something like 130 kilometers an hour along road and uh, there was a white truck turning in front of him. The problem was the, the sky was also white. So the cameras saw the white truck against the white, the white sky. The radar sensors saw nothing in front of it because the car was looking out under the truck. There was no wheels in the way. And then uh, the car just drove at 130 kilometers an hour straight into the, the, the wheels of the truck, just wasn't able to stop in time. Uh, so 
so this is the danger. This is the real danger with uh, with semi-autonomous vehicles is that maybe we place too much trust in the technology. The technology will work for the most most of the time, but there will be scenarios in which it won't work. And we need to be careful. We need to think about that. So when designers are designing autonomous cars, they think in terms of almost like the, the horse and rider. There's some intelligence in the, the vehicle, in this case the horse, um, or the autonomous vehicle as, as we're trying to uh, as we're trying to to develop. Uh, but also you have the the intelligence and the um, the ideas and the perception of the driver. And um, we have this kind of uh, concept of a handover of control or a sharing of control uh, between the between the horse and riders. And we're looking at similar um, models for um, for autonomous vehicles. So what's inside an autonomous car? Um, well, the main components are we have sensors to sense our environment. So the environment is everything from uh, the, the road surface uh, to the uh, to buildings and road signs that are all around and particularly the, uh, the, the road users. So most particularly we're looking at pedestrians, other vehicles um, and I suppose other road users, animals or anything, that, any debris or anything that may find its, its way um, onto the, the road. The sensor then perceives this environment and uh, here is shown as an example of a camera but there's lots of different types of sensors on, on cars nowadays. And then that data that comes from the sensors on the vehicle facing outwards, inwards, front, back, left, right, uh, all goes into a, a pretty substantial computer and uh, uh, quite a powerful computer with lots of memory and the ability to process through huge amounts of data very, very quickly. And then ultimately, this computer makes a decision about control. And you know, when you think about controlling a car, it's actually pretty simple. You uh, try to figure out the angle of the steering wheel, and then you try to figure out what speed you need to go at. Um, so the control is, is relatively straightforward to ensure that your vehicle um, goes where it needs to go. The trick is to know when and where um, to send that vehicle. Um, and it's funny, you look at all the different technologies that are in there, the sensor, the processor, the control, and all the, the thousands and millions and even uh, more lines of code that are running the, uh, these vehicles. And, you know, in the old-fashioned um, human-driven vehicle, we, uh, we take care of all this, we sense our environment, we make our decisions, and then we input the control on the steering wheel or on the pedals. Um, or on the gear levers as, as is necessary, um, yeah, depending on the, the type of vehicle that we're working. What's inside one of these autonomous cars? Well, of course, you'll have the engine and the, or the batteries, I suppose, as it's going to be in a few years' time, and all of the, the machinery that's required to actually turn the wheels. But then there's a whole load of electronic uh, wizardry in there to make the, the autonomous vehicle sense its environment and make its decisions. So the first thing you'll see up here in top left is a, a global positioning system antenna. So it has GPS. So a GPS will tell you where you are on any uh, any part of the surface of the planet. Uh, but even modern GPS is so good now that um, you can actually tell to within about a centimeter where you are uh, in the world. So that's uh, good enough actually to tell you what position you're you're keeping on the road and how far away you are from the white line. So it's really good actually for uh, for navigation but of course gps on its own isn't enough you always have to be able to sense the environment so that's why there's a whole lot of other sensors so you'll see a radar sensor uh, at the back you see a radar sensors here at the front so the idea is that these are sending out signals and they're looking for um, these signals will bounce off any obstacles that they come across and they'll return the reflections will return back just kind of like a bat does their their echolocation uh, and then the computers inside will will process the signals and try and calculate what's out there. You may have seen um, on some test cars or maybe some of the Google cars going around this uh, this metal frame on the top of the car with this metal box rotating. So that's a, a lidar system, which effectively sends out laser um, light out into the environment. Uh, which is then reflected from uh, objects in the environment and comes back through the lens into the system and gets recorded and then put together by a computer to generate a, a 3D map of, uh, of uh, uh, everything surrounding the vehicle. So the reason it spins is so that you can generate a, a map from uh, all the way around the vehicle. Um, we'll see a little bit about the LiDAR in, in, in a couple of seconds. 
Um, you also have video cameras. This one here is a video camera shown looking forward, but sometimes they can have multiple cameras looking forward for near uh, objects and far away objects. You can have cameras on the front and the left and right uh, mirrors here for looking up and down the road if, at a, a junction. You can have mirrors on the wing mirrors for, um, or, or cameras on the wing mirrors looking on the, the left and right side of the vehicle so that you can generate a, a view around the vehicle so that you can see where you're going when you're parking. Um, you have ultrasonic sensors that are really good for very close in um, uh, monitoring of the environment. So if you're doing um, parking, you can get a very accurate measure to, uh, of the distance um, to, uh, let's say, a pedestrian or another car or some other obstacle that might be near you. Where the radar is used for a longer distance um, detection of objects, the ultrasonics is used for shorter range stuff. And all of this is then passed into a computer in the middle of the car somewhere in the heart of the car. In, in many cases, it's distributed computers with where there's hundreds and hundreds of computers within the cars, um, but we're moving towards a kind of a centralized system where there's a central computer that just makes the decision ultimately, that simple decision, uh, whether to move the steering wheel or whether to uh, move the car um, forward or backwards and choose the speed that it's going to travel at. LiDAR creates kind of a really cool and interesting view of the world. This is what uh, might be seen from the likes of a Google car. So it's this device on the top of the car that has generated the scene. So effectively what's happened is it's sent out laser beams, a number of different laser beams at different heights along the scene. And you can see that there's reflections from things like people here, taller people, smaller people. You've got reflections from cars, you've got reflections from buildings. So the nice thing is that you can generate a, a 3D map uh, and tell the distance to objects. And in some cases you can, uh, pretty accurately tell what they are so you can run computer programs that will identify what those things are but we also have cameras on the cars so if we have the footage from the cameras we can also merge it with this lidar feed and we can get a really good um, sense of what's in the environment of the of the car and then um, if we were to look at that over a period of time we can see this bicycle moving and we can project the trajectory so figure out where it's going to go over the next few seconds so that we can determine whether the car is going to be safe as it makes its way um, along the road. So you can see, it doesn't really learn much about road markings or things like that, but it does um, a pretty good job of picking up things that are off the surface of the road, so the likes of people and, uh, and buildings and other infrastructure like that. So this all leads then to uh, a cocoon of sensors, as it's called. So you have the sensors that will measure uh, long distance for the likes of adaptive cruise control to ensure that you don't um, crash into something as you're driving along on your, your cruise control um, but also uh, you have shorter range radar and things like that for emergency braking so if things get very close to you uh, pedestrians come into this uh, this last few meters uh, from the, the, the bonnet of the car and um, then the systems will kick in and, uh, and take some emergency action to let's say emergency brake or, or avoid a collision You've got um, cameras that monitor traffic signs and lane departure and cross traffic alerts. So if you're coming out at a junction, you'll have cameras that will look up and look down to make sure that you don't um, pull out onto the road in, in front of, uh, of, uh, of people or that if there's pedestrians crossing that you mightn't see, the, the cameras will be there to detect those things for you. Again, you've got the environment mapping ar around the, the vehicle you've got. Uh, just a camera mounted on the, the wing mirror there will show you a huge area to the side of the vehicle. And then you've got another uh, array of sensors at the back um, that are going to, uh, uh, for rear parking and reversing, they're going to look at the blind spots of your vehicle and just make sure that you're not, uh, you're not caught out with things that you, uh, you, you cannot see from the car. So things that might be on the ground, you're never going to see them. Maybe a child at the back of the vehicle. You might not see them without the assistance of cameras and radars and lidars and all that kind of stuff. But these things also have limitations because um, crazy things happen on the road. Um, not something you see very often, but this is a, a scene from a road somewhere. Um, this is something that you will see. Uh, I won't say you see it regularly, but... Um, you will see cars where they're driving along with very small uh, windows of, uh, uh, of the, or portions of the windscreen where you can actually see out where people just haven't gone to the trouble of, of uh, demisting or clearing off the snow off the, or, or ice off the, the surface of the car. What happens if you come across a, a malfunctioning traffic uh, light where you get a, both a, a go and a stop um, signal at the same time? A human would know what to do with that piece of information. They just 
um, try to figure out what everybody else is doing and make sure that you can get through the junction fairly cleanly and safely but a computer might be totally confused maybe the right thing to do is stop in this situation but a communion can or, or a human can use their um, their judgment uh, to figure out what's going on there um, or there's just things that defy explanation so uh, how could you ever expect a computer to figure out what's going on in a scene like this um, even road signs can be a little bit uh, strange they can tell you some information that that is kind of difficult to process or uh, or uh, or make any use of so um, I don't know what you do with the information that a cow may fall out of the sky at any time um, or to stop uh, shooting at, uh, at targets um, which are the road signs um, maybe drunken people crossing the road might be something that you can uh, look out for people on their knees or wobbling um, but I don't know why anybody would want to drive through uh, something that describes itself as a minefield uh, so I don't really know what you do with that information but we have these car systems they have lots of sensors um, they're connected by huge networks of, uh, of, of uh, cables that connect all of these systems together so even within the engine bay of, this, of the car there's a huge number of different sensors and systems that, uh, that, that, that convey information around the vehicle um, we have a whole load of electronic control units and these are computers and these computers are uh, taking information in from the sensors and from the the components of the engine and from the environment and they're putting it all together to try to figure out uh, how to operate the vehicle most efficiently and uh, and uh, as safely as possible and you can have up to 200 ECUs in a modern car so these these ECUs or electronic control units are, are, are effectively computers so like I was saying earlier they're distributed in in cars nowadays but there is a kind of a sense that um, it might be a good idea to, to pull all of this computing uh, capacity together into just one place and have one um, main computer that, that controls many of the functions of the vehicle. Looking at the electrical wiring, it's, it's almost like, a, um, I suppose, a, a view inside the human body with all the different nerves and, uh, and, and connections that, that join the various kind of sensors into the, the beating heart of the, of the vehicle itself. So you can see all of these wires are several tens of kilometers of, of cabling that run around the, the vehicle um, either powering things or measuring information or sending data to and from uh, various different things and that's that's before you start looking at all of the uh, all, all of the connections in the engine bay with all the fluids and all the stuff that's, that's going on there in the engine um, or if you're talking about a battery powered car um, all of the the connections and the the energies that, that have to be uh, controlled and the flow of energy that has to be managed within the electric vehicle but this is what a, a an ECU an electronic control unit looks like or an engine control unit to kind of refer them refer to them as in, in terms of engines and stuff like that but really they're just computers the the fact that they're an ECU is is more to do with the fact that they're in this kind of um, sealed metallic box that is hardened against um, you know temperatures uh, high and low temperatures and moisture and all that kind of stuff so these things are really are ruggedized pieces of electronics that are used to keep cars going for several years um, but it's not alone just outwards facing sensors many new cars have inwards facing sensors so here's a, a view of a car that we had on test uh, looking at um, ways that new ways that we can um, manage and monitor drivers so you can see that there was some cameras here looking at the the eyes of the person we had a, an EEG um, cap uh, worn to monitor brain waves and the person was wearing a wrist strap and a chest strap to monitor their um, their heart rate and their respiration and uh, sweat and uh, uh, trying to establish their stress levels and things like that so there's lots of things in your cars now that uh, that will monitor the, the driver to see that they're awake if they've got their eyes open see if they're attentive see if they're looking at the road because it's it's really important when you're driving around that you're looking at the road because there's lots of different surfaces and within the car that are important uh, and there's a lot of them that are unimportant to the driving task as well so you want the person to be looking uh, a lot of their time here but if you're making a lane change you want them to look here or maybe you want them to look here 
or if they're at a roundabout, maybe you want them to look out the side window to see oncoming traffic. So it's very important that the driver is looking in there at the right places to make sure that they know what's happening. You don't want them to spend too much time looking at the, the interior surfaces of the car. So it's really important that, that we know how the drivers are, are, are getting on. And it's really, really important where you have autonomous vehicles or semi-autonomous vehicles where the driver is, is in control of the vehicle for some of the time and the artificial intelligence, the computer, is running the, the car for the remainder of the time. And it's particularly important that handover where uh, the car has been driving itself for some time and then it wants to hand over to the human being. So you want to make sure that the human being has their hands on the steering wheel, their eyes are looking forward and that they have been doing this for a few seconds to give them a chance to figure out what's going on in the road before they actually take over control of the vehicle. So all of these things are actually really, uh, really important. So how quickly are these things going to emerge? Well, what we're seeing is now that the, uh, the dumb cars, as they've been called, are starting to really phase out about um, last year and into this year. It's the last time you really see even the cheapest cars that have no level of, uh, of driver assistance. You can see that the majority of cars on sale now, so here we are in 2020, they're level one, level two. So do a small amount of, uh, of uh, things like cruise control and maybe um, monitoring, uh, lane, lane monitoring and lane keeping assistance and all that kind of stuff. But, but here you can see as the, the, the colors get kind of towards the darker purple, that's where you see your level five, your higher level automation. So from next year or maybe the year after, we're expecting to see things uh, starting to emerge where you can get the, the higher level, uh, level five automation. The likes of Tesla are claiming that they have it ready. I'm not so sure they have it ready for all situations. I think we're probably two or three years out from seeing it uh, arriving in any serious numbers. But there is this expectation that, um, that, that whether we use it or not is, is another thing, but they will have level five capabilities by a, in about 10 years time. Personally, I think it'll probably go a little bit longer than that before we have level five in all situations, but I can certainly see level three and level four starting to gain um, ground. Also, uh, what, you'll, what you might notice is that there's, it's, there's an expectation that the number of cars that are sold in the world will actually drop um, as the years go by because people are becoming less interested in the, the driving task because, well, if these cars are going to drive them around, it doesn't really matter uh, so much about uh, about the high end, maybe the sportiness of the vehicle or the feel of the vehicle, really it's just a box that gets you from A to B while you're uh, engaged in other activities on your phone or, or laptops or whatever other tablet computers uh, you might be carrying around wearables um, at the time. So uh, so it's kind of interesting to see that the predictions there that, that car ownership and car production is going to start to, to drop away where we have the likes of the Uber and Lyft and all these guys are going to become the, the technologies of the future. In terms of the numbers of lines of code in these things, these things are it's just fascinating to see the amount of, uh, of, of software that's being used to control them. So if you take a, a Boeing 787 Dreamliner, a really nice modern high-end um, aircraft, you're talking about six and a half million lines of code in them. So if you were to look at uh, something like an F-35, Joint Strike Fighter, US, you know, you know um, best um, in class military aircraft probably in the world. You might expect that you're talking maybe 10, 15 million lines of code. Actually, no, 5.7, surprisingly, a little bit lower than even a Boeing 787 Dreamliner. A high end car, you might think, well, surely that would have maybe one or two million lines of code, but actually, the amount of software and these things is quite amazing so you could be talking at 20 million lines of code just for the sat nav you could be talking two to three hundred million lines of code and on, on some of the higher end cars that are out there right now and we're we're heading fast for one billion lines of code within a car and that's an astonishing amount of software and what makes it just a little bit um, worrisome is the fact that when you're writing code um, they say that if you're writing less than 2,000 lines of code, you can expect between 0 and 25 bugs per 1,000 lines of code. If you're writing 2K to 6K, so 2,000, 6,000 lines, you're talking 0 to 40. So it kind of increases uh, as, the, as the, the amount of code goes up. So from 6K to 64K, so uh, 0.5 to 50 um, bugs per 1,000. So anything above you know, five, 10,000 lines of code, you're pretty much guaranteed there's going to be a bug there. 
Um, so greater than 512k, you're talking four to 100 bugs per thousand lines of code. Now, what is going to happen where you have a high-end car <coughs> with a billion uh, lines of code in it? So there's a lot of work to be done to make sure this software works and this software is good and this software is robust and the software is safe. So there's a lot of work for people in this space uh, over the next over uh, several decades, I would say. And just to show how this is, is impacting on, on uh, the manufacturers and the quality of the cars that are out there, this is the JD Power um, Vehicle Dependability Study. It ranks cars um, according to their reliability. So it, it, the number here beside the manufacturer tells the number of problems per 100 vehicles. So if you have Kia, uh, we're just picking this one nearest 100, that pretty much statistically means that every Kia that comes out has one problem with it. Um, if you go down here to BMW, you're talking about two faults um, per vehicle. So Peugeot uh, in 2019 was, the, uh, was the, the most reliable car. So this actually comes from actual drivers. It's a survey of uh, all the people who buy these different makes of cars and they report on the number of errors. So this isn't just anybody given their opinion. This is actual factual stuff coming back from owners of these vehicles where they report on the number of errors. So there's a lot of interesting things and I could talk about this slide for ages. But if you look at Pujo at the top there, you say, a bit surprising, maybe weren't known to be the most reliable of cars over the years, but they really have got their act together. But look who's down here, Mercedes, uh, you've got Audi, you've got BMW, you've got Jaguar down there, you've, okay. Um, Fiat, maybe not entirely a surprise, That's the, uh, they have been known to have had problems uh, for many years. But even Toyota, um, what's going on here? So it seems, and, and uh, I think most people are in agreement with this, that these guys are the earlier adopters of the technology. And when you adopt this technology earlier, you have this issue with all the lines of code and you have software issues and you can't connect your phone to the service, that service. Uh, so these early adopters of the higher tech are, are being burned a little bit in terms of um, reliability and dependability. You can see the Peugeot, the Skoda, the Hyundai, Nissan, Suzuki, um, not the high-end cars, but certainly the most reliable cars. And this is based on, on the people who own them. Volvo were way down here for many years. so it's, it's, Quite interesting that Volvo have managed to push themselves um, way up the, the list uh, and, and are now uh, quite, quite well positioned as, uh, I suppose, the, the top of the, the premium level um, cars. So while programming is one thing, um, what's happening nowadays is that these cars are, are not even actually being programmed to, uh, to uh, sense their environment and understand their environment. They use these uh, neural networks, this artificial intelligence that you hear so much about. And the whole idea of an artificial intelligence, uh, a neural network, is that you don't um, you don't program it specifically to identify something. You just set up this kind of mesh of uh, of computing nodes, and then you give it loads and loads of examples of of uh, things in the environment, and then you say well, that's a, an Audi car. Uh, and then you take tens, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of different photographs of Audis, different colors, different perspectives against different backgrounds. And you just keep saying, that's an Audi car, that's an Audi car, that's an Audi car, an Audi A7, Audi A4, whatever it is. So that when it sees an image then of uh, a car uh, that it hasn't seen before, it'll be able to identify it. So the idea is that it'll process um, all of these things without you really knowing what's going on in between. So basically what happens is you feed in the image and then it breaks it down into a whole load of different component parts. So it might be looking just for the places where there's bits of contrast and then it might look for larger things like wheels and wheel arches and the angles of the the um, the, the, the windscreen and maybe the wing mirrors and things like that. And then it starts to move up towards kind of larger collections of each of these lower level features until it arrives at a decision. So when I see these neural networks, I, while they're brilliant, uh, I, I often think of them kind of like like the Father Dougal type character. You, you know what you're telling them, but you never really know what they understand. And, and that's the problem with the neural network. You know, it, it, it gets it right really, really often, but then when it gets it wrong, it gets it spectacularly wrong. So these are the challenges that, that face us in the future. 
Um, but cars are going to be part of a, a huge ecosystem of, uh, of electronics and communication and data and sensors, um, where everything in the in the environment uh, exists as part of uh, a part of the Internet of Things, where um, every vehicle, every person will be wearing uh, these devices. You'll have the buses and the taxis, and you'll have tour buses and ambulances and uh, aircraft and railways and all of those and things connected together. So they're all the things that that kind of move, but also lots of fixed objects in the environment. Um, you might have. Uh, buildings, you might have sensors uh, out on farms monitoring animals, monitoring uh, water resources and all of these things building up a kind of a, a digital picture of, uh, of, of what's going on. Um, here in NUI Galway and my research group we're doing s some trials uh, of these kinds of things ourselves. So um, this is a, a picture of our, our test vehicle. So we have um, a, a new Mercedes from last year that is uh, currently it's fitted out with a whole load of uh, sensors for uh, autonomous driving. We're also building some uh, fixed node sensors that we're going to be placing on campus over the next few weeks and months. And the idea is that uh, we can feed information from uh, these fixed node sensors, send it up to the cloud and pass the information back down to the vehicle so that as it drives along, uh, as it sees what these VRU are vulnerable road users, so particularly pedestrians and cyclists, uh, it might see somebody uh, walking along uh, and maybe the car is blocked by this other vehicle so it can't see through this other vehicle but maybe it can be seen from this camera which passes the information up to the cloud and down to the car to, to warn it of a, a pedestrian. And part of the work that we're doing is trying to make this stuff work in, uh, so I suppose work together in terms of the vehicle and the infrastructure but also for, for poor weather and nighttime operation. Um, so just to give you a sense of how, how difficult it can be, um, this is a maybe a scene uh, that you might get at night, um, maybe snow or, or heavy rain and lots of reflections from lots of different surfaces and you know from the point of view of trying to tell an autonomous vehicle how to drive, which which of the red lights would you stop at here? Because uh, uh, like the Christmas song says, there's red lights all around, um, but the, the, the cost of getting it wrong is, uh, is, is a pretty high price to pay. Um, so that's one of the challenges that hopefully we're going to be looking at over the next few years as, as part of our research and maybe it'll be something that you, you might like to join us in a few years on, uh, on developing some of this technology. So when we talk about autonomous vehicles I, I think there's a kind of a, a few kind of slightly funny and quirky uh, unforeseen consequences. Um, pedestrians can bully cars. If you know that a, a car is uh, being driven autonomously uh, by an, uh, an artificial intelligence, just walk out in front of it because it's going to stop, um, which might have an interesting effect on, on somebody who's trying to get a, an hour of sleep while they, they're driven around in their car. Um, if this car is going to be jamming on the brakes all the time with pedestrians just walking across. Nowadays, there's a, a kind of a, I suppose, an unwritten contract that we, we kind of keep separate from people who are driving the cars and from the, the people, the pedestrians who are looking to use the road, we try to keep a separation because uh, there's always that danger that you might be missed by the driver. But if you know that the artificial intelligence is always going to break, then why not just uh, walk out in front of it? Um, another place that vehicles might be challenged is, uh, uh, you can imagine these two guys coming home from a night out. Uh, could be mighty crack to jump out on the road in front of a, an autonomous vehicle to shake up the people inside. Um, but also lots of people suggest that maybe uh, these vehicles could be used to, to drive people home when they're not in a, a fit state to, uh, to, to take control of a vehicle themselves. So it's hard to know how that's going to go. What would an autonomous vehicle make of these types of situations that we're seeing in Ireland? Um, so where you have to, you know, a, a flood doesn't look like a, a road surface that has any potholes on it. So potholes is one thing, but if you're on water, it looks completely flat and looks uh, like a, a completely viable surface. So how does the autonomous vehicle figure out how to navigate carefully through a, a, a flood? And then the likes of these potholes, what do you do? Do you go straight into them? Do you drive around them? Is there a way to navigate through? Do you just stop and say, I, I, I can't do this anymore? Um, or even a situation where you have road markings that are partially worn or have been erased and the, the, the black paint over them has just washed away. So now that the old ones the old road markings are coming back to confuse the, the new ones. So uh, lots of tricky situations like that that could be difficult for 
uh, a computer to, to try to figure out. Another thing, uh, if we have somebody who's part-time driver and part-time passenger, you could call them a drivinger, uh, but who's in control? Who's responsible? Um, if you're driving along and you're looking out, how do you know who's actually in control if uh, should an accident happen? And, uh, you know, are you going to go to the uh, to the judge and say, well, actually, that you know that stupid mistake wasn't wasn't my fault; it was the car's fault. And maybe there'll be black boxes there that will uh, that will record uh, what has happened over the last while. But you know, it's going to get a little bit trickier to try to figure out um, who's at fault uh, when when crazy stuff happens on the road, as it always will. Um, another thing that's a really unforeseen thing is that motion sickness will become a problem for drivers because. If the driver is is being driven around in their vehicle, they're not in control. They're probably looking at their phone. They might be looking at their mobile. Uh, certainly not looking out the window and keeping uh, their their um, eyes on, on on the task at hand. Uh, the chances are they could become motion sick. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever become motion sick, but um, the last thing on earth you would want to do when you become motion sick is uh, is take control and drive a car. Um, so that's going to become a problem. We're going to have to deal with that problem. Another issue is what happens if your uh, if your car gets hacked. Um, you have vehicles with the potential to wreak havoc on the road uh, because a it, everything is controlled by software, so it could be possible to hack into the vehicle maybe over the air with over the air updates if somebody had the, the know how to get access to the vehicle systems. But also, even at the point of production or maintenance, it would be relatively easy to put in a malicious piece of code into that those hundreds of thousands those millions those even potentially billions of lines of code in there um, to do something do something uh, uh, malicious um, so uh, security is something that's going to have to be looked at but the future is bright you know we can save lots of lives we can certainly improve our quality of life we can do something more productive rather than sitting in a car while we control its every function, while we take responsibility for our safety and for those around us, where we can just let the systems do what they've been designed to do. And so the, the future is very, very bright for these things. We may even see flying cars at long last. This is a, a, um, an example of a system being developed by Boeing. So it's been prototyped, kind of based on a kind of a, a hybrid between a, um, a quadcopter and an aeroplane. So you can see the fixed wing for kind of efficient forward motion. And you can see that uh, we have these quad uh, quadcopter type propellers to get the, the vehicle off the ground. And there's, there's loads of companies developing this technology. And even the likes of Uber have said in the next um, two to three years that they'll be running some tests for, um, for, for they'll be piloted taxis, um, flying taxis. But the, the ultimate aim is that these things would become autonomous. And so we could be um, having, having flying cars uh, around much sooner uh, than, than we realize. Um, so that's, that's an exciting thing. Another area that I think as uh, pardon the pun, it's a, an area for growth is, uh, is in agriculture uh, and the fact that um, you know, a lot of the jobs that are performed on a farm can be monotonous in terms of tilling and maintaining fields. I'm not talking about you know, the, the more complex stuff of going on road, but certainly the in-field activities um, at the moment, a lot of them are controlled now by, by satellite guided tractors in, in the fields, certainly for larger scale stuff, um, maybe outside of Ireland more so than in Ireland. But why not have an autonomous tractor with no driver, just a, a basically a drone with wheels, lots of power, um, and uh, just set it off to, uh, to take care of some of the more, danger, more mundane jobs on the, uh, on the farm. So thanks for listening. This is, these are all the sponsors of our research. Um, uh, we have uh, a lot of research uh, at the moment with Valio, um, uh, a company in Tune who put a lot of high-tech stuff on very high-end cars. Also, McHale Engineering from Ballon Robe on autonomous or on um, agricultural vehicles uh, and agricultural machinery. Um, we have a lot of sponsorship from the likes of um, Science Foundation through uh, Science Foundation Ireland through uh, Lero, the Irish Software Research Centre. Uh, but we also have funding from Enterprise Ireland and Under Horizon 2020 European Money and the Irish Research Council. So thanks very much for listening to my, my talk and I hope you have uh, a great time at NUA Galway. I hope you learn a lot. I hope you end up with a, a great career in engineering 
and I hope to see you at some point in person on campus over the next few years. Thank you very much.